وعروة وثقا فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو استق قائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما محمد إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل أفا إن مات أو قتل إن قلبتم على أقابكم ومن ينقلب على أقبيه فلن يضر الله شيئا وسيجزي الله الشاكرين صلوات بيج محمد وآل محمد السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ دی آیت that I recited for you is from Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3 آیت number 144 which talks about directly an incident that took place in the battle of Uhud in the Madani life of the Holy Prophet and the translation in reference to the occasion that we are going through, these ayam in which we will be commemorating the wafat and as some say shahadat, although the word wafat is sometimes used even for shahadat, so it does not really make any difference, of the Holy Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are evidence and dalail which prove that it was actually shahadat and it was not just a natural death. And therefore, this ayat talks and hints toward the apparent uh, aspect of that concept that if Prophet was to leave, what will you do? You know, because the thought of losing someone so important such as the Holy Prophet. I mean, in our time, nobody is compared to the Holy Prophet. But imagine the thought of losing someone that important. You know, a lot of countries, they worry about when they have established some sort of ruler, some sort of leader, that what will happen after we lose such a leader? You know, how things will go south, things will go wrong, absolutely chaos will happen if so-and-so leader, for example, was to leave. For example, in Islamic Republic of Iran, this debate has always been around that what will happen, you know, if uh, the leader of the revolution is no longer alive, who will be the next leader? So this conversation is something which is ongoing. But as it happens, you know, even in the times of the great maraji of ours that have passed in the time of Ayatollah Burujardi, this thought was there. Then Ayatollah Hakim came about. In the time of Ayatollah Hakim, same thought was there. Then Ayatollah Khui came about, and as well as Imam Khomeini was there. And then that thought was there again as to who will replace such a great personality. There came along many of the maraji, including uh, in Najaf and Iran. So therefore, this thought is always there if you lose that great, great personality. Now, obviously, nobody could be compared with the personality of the Holy Prophet and him spending so much time with the people that brought them out of Wulamat towards Nur, brought them out of utter darkness towards light and guided them to the path of salvation. Now, having a thought that this Prophet will no longer be amongst us is a very scary thought for them. Which Prophet prepared them to an extent when he gave that khutbah in Ghadir al-Hum. He began by speaking regarding his demise, which was which is inevitable that he will no longer be with them after a while. Someone knowing his own demise is also an indication that they feel that there is a natural cause which will be eventually taking their life. But and knowing this, that having this knowledge is also it speaks volumes as far as the ilm of the Holy Prophet is concerned. So, this ayat, the translation says, Muhammad is but an apostle. Other apostles have passed before him. If he dies or if he's slain, will you turn back on your heels? Anyone who turns back on his heels will not harm Allah in the least. And soon Allah will reward the grateful. So the thought came about in the time of the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, the history tells us that there came a time that this verse was revealed right after the Holy Prophet was struck by a stone on his forehead by the enemy forces from the Makkah. And he started bleeding. He started bleeding, you know, and he fell to the ground. And people could not see him afterwards. This r rumor was then publicized. There was just, you know, He's spoken about. People were saying, you know, hearsay, word of mouth, getting along here and there, especially in the battlefield where you are fighting in the midst of this war. Someone said, oh, Prophet was struck on the head and he's dead and he's killed and he has died. And some people uh, by mistake took, you know, death of Mus'ab to be the Prophet. This brought joy and excitement to the unbelievers, obviously. Prophet is there biggest enemy and his followers obviously go along and if they're able to kill the 
the leader of the enemies, then they have accomplished a, a great feat. And therefore, they started, you know, excitement and the, the joy was seen. The unbelievers started doing that. And then many weak-hearted Muslims, they ran away from the battlefield saying, oh, our leader, our ruler is dead. How are we going to survive? So they also left the field and then they ran away. Someone resorted to seeking immunity from Abu Sufyan, went up to Abu Sufyan saying, look, you know, Prophet just died and yes, we were standing against you, but you remember that we have um, good old days that we go back to, that we were part of our same family, same clan, you know, um, please forgive me for standing up against you. It started seeking immunity from Abu Sufyan. In response to all this, some Muslims said, even if Prophet was dead, let's just assume, although this is just a rumor, even if the Prophet was dead, the path of Prophet and his God is still there. So we're not going to turn our heels away from the path that they have brought for us. Yes, he's a prophet, like all the other prophets were sent before him. They passed away, they died as well, and this prophet is going to die as well. Although this is just a rumor at the moment, but if he was to pass away, if he was to die, if he was killed, whether in a battlefield or outside, then are you going to turn around and turn away, going and seeking immunity from Abu Sufyan? running away from the battlefield, leaving all the other Muslims, you know, stranded while there are every bit of you, every single one of you is needed to go ahead and combat and to fight until the last breath. Yes, this was the message that was given at that part. And narrations mentioned that Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib wasalam, he emerged and he picked up the Holy Prophet and he said, Hadha Muhammad. Hadha Muhammad, you know, this is Muhammad, this is Muhammad. He's not dead, he's not slain, he's not killed, he's still amongst us. And obviously that boosted the, you know, that lost identity of the Muslims that they had lost in that little while. It gave them that, you know, energy back again and they were able to stand up. So this is just a brief background of as far as the, the concept, even the thought of losing the Holy Prophet, how scary it was for some people which was general, you know, genuine, but at some time, it was also the scary thought was how people stranded the path. They ran away, and they even started seeking immunity from the enemies. In another place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks regards to the Holy Prophet. He says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا عَهَدٍ مِنْ رَجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْنَ عَلِيمًا This is in Surah Ahzab, ayat number 40. He said, Muhammad is not the father of any man amongst you, but he is the apostle of Allah and the seal of the prophets, and Allah has knowledge of all things. Now, this is not saying that he does not have children or those children of his belong to him, that they don't have the right to call him Baba or father. No, that's not what it's saying. Rather, this ayat was also revealed under a specific circumstance. That where people, you know, thought of the Prophet. Both words, Rasul and Nabi, are used in this ayat. So let me just explain briefly this ayat. And Rasul means the possessor of the book, and Nabi, one who gives the news. Rasul is messenger, and Nabi is the one who acts on the message. So a lot of time, Anbiya came, but they were not necessarily Rasul. So they just took the Rasarat of the previous Nabi, previous Rasul, and then they just went about with it. Or sometimes they were so strong that they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they were you know, amongst the azam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the book, gave them a separate sharia, and they're the one who brought it. Khatam means a ring. So, you know, the word khatam is used for ring in Arabic, which means that in the past people would impose their names, and that would become sort of their signature, right? So if they were to put their seal on something, that would be, you know, resulting in the sense that, yes, this is uh, from them, and it is used for stamping purposes. Here it means that he's the seal of the prophets. He's the last of the prophets. That means he's sealed all the previous prophets that came before him, and no more of the prophets would be sent afterwards. Although there are many verses and a hadith which mention the permanent nature of Prophet Muhammad's being final messenger, there are some hadith in this reference as well, where Prophet himself was saying, La Nabiya Badi, you know, when he spoke to Amil Mu'mineen in reference to when he was going to Battle of Tabuk and he did not take Amil Mu'mineen with him and he left him behind. And people started saying, look, Rasulullah does not care for you or he does not think of you or anything. And therefore, that's why he left you behind. So people are looking at it from all different directions. Rasulullah said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa illa la nabiyya baadi. You are to me how Harun was to Musa except 
there's no Nabi after me. So, La Nabi Yabadi is a sentence that Prophet had uttered on numerous occasions. Or, Halalu Muhammad, for example, Halalun Abadan ila yawm al Qiyamah. That which is halal from the time of the Holy Prophet will remain halal until the Day of Judgment. That means what? That means if there was another Prophet to come afterwards, they would be able to alter that halal into haram, for example, or haram into halal, for example. Or they would have this ability to change what the Prophet has said. But he is the last Prophet, he is Khatimul Anbiya, and no other Prophet is coming after him. So the Prophet is referred to as Muhammad is not the father. People raise objections when the Holy Prophet married Zainab, the divorced wife of his adopted son, Zaid ibn Haritha. And Zaid and Zainab, they were married when this marriage did not continue and he divorced her. Prophet went ahead and married Zainab. People said, well, how can you marry your own daughter-in-law? Rasulullah said, this ayat was revealed that Makana Muhammad, Aba Ahadim min Rajalikum. Prophet is not a father of any one of you men. So when he adopted, this was his adopted son. This was not his biological son, real son, which obviously would make it haram upon him to marry. And therefore, this was the sequence and the reason why this ayat was revealed. Going back to the previous ayah which I recited, that Wama Muhammadun illa Rasul, Qad Khalat min Qablihi Rasul, that the duty of the Holy Prophet is to propagate the message of Allah. It is us who must continue the path. And that's why the Muslimin, after hearing this rumor that the Holy Prophet had been killed, he said, what if he's killed? Does that mean we turn back on our heels and go back to the days of Jahiliyyah and the ignorant era? No. The main thing is even showing more importance to um, you know, while Prophet has all the importance in the world, but the message that he has brought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has even more superiority over him. That's what it shows us. That even if he's not there, the message is very important. That message is something which has to continue. So even if the person who delivered the message is no longer amongst you, does not mean that, you know, you just turn back to your heels. No. You continue the message, you continue on following what has been brought to you. Did the previous nations turn away from the religions after the death of their Prophet? No. This was not a common practice, so why do you go about? This was, these words were used precisely because there were people who were turning back. And they were going back to zaman jahiliyyah They were going back to their old habits that they used to do in the, in the back old days. And therefore this ayat was revealed. And there are many other ayat in Quran, especially in Surah Azab, leading up to this particular ayat. If you were to read, you know where ayat Tathir is up until this ayat, you will find how many of the wives of the Holy Prophet are addressed in this, in this way. La tabarruj, tabarruj, tabarruj jahiliyat al-ula. La tabarrajna tabarruj jahiliyat al-ula. Do not go back to your, you know, old jahiliyat and ignorant time, the uh, era which was the ignorant era. Go, don't go back to those customs that you used to do after the Holy Prophet is no longer with you. An Islamic society should have such a formation and solidarity that even after their leader leaves, it doesn't affect the society too much. If he's dead or if he's slain, you know, nothing changes. Prophet is also bound to the godly tradition and natural laws of life after death. So, yes, you know, while, and I recited this ayat last night, if you were here for the majlis as well, that while Prophet says, that ana basharum mithlukum, that ayat of Quran which I recited and chose for the speech last night, Prophet says what? Qul, innama ana basharun mithlukum. Tell them, O Prophet, that indeed I am a human, bashar, like you. You ilayya. But as soon as you start thinking that he's a person like you, he gives this distinction. You ilayya. But I received the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, while I'm same, similar to you, but at the same time, there's a difference and a huge difference. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends revelation onto me. That he brings this wahi to me. And this wahi is given to me only. Comes through Jibra'il. Have you seen Jibra'il? Has Jibra'il brought this wahi to you? Have you ever witnessed him? Or have you received any instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly? No. This is where the distinction lies. Yes, the fact that I am a bashar like you is so that you can learn from my example. That I eat what I eat, that I walk how I walk, what I say, how I treat others, my character. So you can follow the great example and the uswa of the Holy Prophet. So there he's able to be compared with someone. So you look up to him. 
Otherwise, if he was an angel, then you won't be able to see him. And how would he set to be the best of the examples for you? So a rumor is a propaganda of the enemy. When they say mata or kochela, similar tactic is seen by some media outlets, you know, here as well. You know, after every violent attack in the Western world, they are ready to blame it on the Muslims indiscriminately without, you know, having the final reports out. But the first suspicion directly goes towards Muslim um, and they start sending this rumor. And the first thing that comes out that emerges, that's the prevailing thing. That will remain imprinted on your minds and the minds of the masses, even though later on, otherwise it's proven. No, it wasn't a Muslim. It was actually someone, as they refer to as a lone wolf. You know, someone else who went ahead and did, did something. Some, you know, mental case or lunatic or whatever. That news will emerge. But the moment something like this happens, the rumor goes, a Muslim is behind it. That's the first thing that will remain in your, heart, in your minds. You and I will be able to remove that, but the mass will not be able to remove that. So the first thing that comes out, that prevails. Afterwards, you can go do the investigations and whatever emerges, emerges. doesn't really matter. That first impression is how important that is. So Prophet's worldly life may be limited, but his path isn't. One must strengthen their faith to the extent that events of history should not shake them. Yes, these events will take place. There were many despicable events that took place. In fact, the event for which you and I commemorate for two and a half months. Nothing could be bigger than the massacre of Karbala. And nothing could be bigger after the massacre of Karbala to, be, to the event of Harra, where they um, you know, desecrated the city of Medina. Nothing could be bigger than after the desecration of Medina is when they desecrated the Kaaba and they brought the Kaaba down. These were the events that went one after another. All of these, these are, you know, despicable events. But these should not shake you. These should not, you know, turn you away from the reality and from being steadfast. So leaving the path of the Prophet leads to fall uh, um, and going backwards in qalabtum ala aqabikum that's the and the tashbih that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses he said disbelief of the prophet of, of the people does not harm Allah so if even if you were to disbelieve you think it's going to matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no, not one bit it's only going to matter to you that you are the one who after these events are now shaken up and right after these events now you leave the path of the holy prophet now, I'm giving you bigger examples, the massacre of Karbala, the event of Harra, and other events, um, you know, um, um, uh, other events of, 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 um, that took place in the history, the event of Kaaba. These are big events. But I'm talking about even personal events sometimes. They shake us to an extent that we start questioning and doubting in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we lose a loved one, for example, when we lose a job, for example, when we're struggling in our personal life, for example, when we, it's very difficult to, for us to you know, make ends meet, for example, when everything is going against us, for example, everyone is standing up against us, for example, when these sort of things happen one after another in our life, if we go through you know, a drought of you know, five, six years of nothing is going in our way, right away we'll start questioning our belief, our faith. A mother who, for example, has multiple miscarriages, right away they start losing their faith in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, how can I not have a baby? How am I not able to do so? They start questioning. You know, similarly, other people, when smaller things in their life, although they may be very big for them, because you and I cannot understand or underestimate the, you know, the importance of that thing, because you and I haven't faced it. But these events which took place in history, even they should not shake you. The wafat of the Holy Prophet should not shake you, let alone these events that happen in your personal lives on day-to-day -day matter, which are only going to pass away because Quran says, Inna ma'al usre yusra. Fa inna ma'al usre yusra. These ayat are repeated one after another, that indeed after difficulty is ease, and indeed after difficulty is ease. Salawat bihaji Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And as far as the shahadat or wafat of the Holy Prophet is concerned, in fact, it is unanimous belief that it was the shahadat of the Holy Prophet. Now, they all have to die by some means, uh, which would be the natural cause. For example, something happened, someone poisoned them, and that led to their, for example, 
you know, death. But that death then is considered to be shahadat because if that event did not take place, they would have lived. They would have gone on to live even a longer life. They would have survived even longer. And that's why all the masumin were either killed or poisoned. Second Imam said, Although he's he said, none of us is either we are either killed, maqtul, or masmum, or we are poisoned. None of us have died a natural death. So one of the things about the Prophet to which not much heed is paid is his death. Usually it's referred to as a wafat, but sometimes the wafat could also refer to as shahadat. Ibn Sa'ad narrates that the Prophet was poisoned while he was 63 years old. Allah Mahilli narrates that the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet was caused by the poison that he had consumed. Sheikh Atusi narrates the Prophet died of poison two days left in the month of Safar, which is, you know, 28th of the Safar. So all of these rivayat mentioned by these great ulama suggest the fact that the Holy Prophet was martyred. It was the Shahadat. Prophet was perfect in all aspects of life. That is the important thing. Although we are commemorating his Shahadat, but still, what do we learn from the Holy Prophet? He's complete example. It says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He's the most uh, beautiful example as far as the you know, uh, lifestyle is concerned. We unfortunately in our lives waste a lot of time. And when we realize it's too late, Prophet was disciplined in all aspects of life. From dressing, he would wear the most clean and the pure clothes. He would apply perfume. He would, you know, look into water, using it as a mirror to, for example, fix even his hair. Unfortunately, our society thinks the least attentive to himself is the most ascetic. The one who pays very little attention to their physical body or their physical appearance. Although, you know, we speak a great deal about that your beauty should be from within, from your soul and not so much from your body. But you should not neglect the body either. So the Holy Prophet was making all the efforts to be what? Attractive to people. Imagine if you walked around in a fashion as you see some of the Muslims in, in some of the Muslim worlds who claim to be jihadis and whatnot and look at the way they walk around with the thing flying different directions, you know, which is repulsive, right? You're not attractive. As it is, people look at you, it is repulsive and people, you know, turn away. Let alone your afkar, your thoughts and what you're doing, that is also repulsive to people. But also your appearance is something which is repulsive. In the house, the Prophet would, you know, dedicate one part of obviously as they are today in our lives with the TV and games and internet you know, and telephones and smartphones and social media, or these things did not exist. But it's still, he would dedicate one part for his family members. And then the last part was for the people and for the society to look at the problems of the people and to solve them. But you see that in all of these areas, Prophet was at the peak of it. When it came to ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to actually tell him. The one who brought people from worshipping idols to musalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the same prophet, don't stand in musallah too much. You know, take rest sometimes. Don't stand up all night, for example. You know, don't, don't you know, make sure that you don't start getting wounds or, you know, um, uh, there's some sort of, uh, some, something happens to you, for example, of long ibadat, for example. You get tired of long ibadat, for example. So, so he's at the peak of that as well. When it comes to, you know, solving people's problem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to intervene and tell people that you are bothering the Holy Prophet too much. From this moment on, if you want to see the Holy Prophet and consult with him, pay him something. As soon as the money was stipulated in Surah Ma'arij, as soon as the money was stipulated, Surah Mujadala, people you know, stopped bothering the Holy Prophet. Then obviously that ayat was abrogated. The next ayat came and said, it was difficult for you to pay, right? We were just trying to set an example. That Prophet has a private time as well. Don't just go knocking on his door all the time asking him questions. So he was at the peak of that as well. And similarly, when it came to taking care of his family members. So three aspects. And inshallah, I'll conclude with this as I've run out of my time. With Allah, with family, and with community. Let's hope that you and I can also develop the same three habits. Not all of us are 
very, um, you know, good with society, for example, you know, when it comes to meeting and greeting people. And we may not be that social, for example. That's the word I'm looking for. But still, you can divide these three parts. First part with Allah, by worshipping. Alhamdulillah, you know, we perform enough ibadat. 17 minutes maybe in the entire day is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, that's 17 minutes. Just dedicate those 17 minutes for those 17 rak'at for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the utmost uh, khudu and khushu. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah is going to expect, uh, accept it and nothing more is needed inshallah. With family, spending quality time with them, you know. When you're only spending 17 minutes for Allah and there are 24 hours in a day, you need, for example, eight hours of sleep or six hours of sleep, whatever the amount that you need sleep. What is it that you're doing the remaining 18 hours? Maybe you go to work, you know, let's say eight, 10 hours for work. The remaining time, you should make sure that you divide it with your family. Make sure that you're able to give them quality time. It doesn't have to be that you're always there for the dinner. Some people work at the time of dinner. So it could be at another time. But make sure whatever time is given is quality time and it's not a distraction. It's not a time when you're sitting with your children and you're looking at your phone and you're talking to them and half-heartedly you're responding to their requests and the same way they're busy on their phones and you are busy on your phones or watching TV or something else. No, not distracted. Quality time is something which is needed. And lastly, with community, by solving their problems. This third one has you know, one more point worth mentioning that the Holy Prophet would embrace people. This is what he said. Because not everybody had access to the Holy Prophet while he was very accessible. There are people who live far and away. They couldn't make it to Medina. It was very difficult for them to come to Medina. So when they couldn't make it, this is what Prophet said to them. He said, وَأَبْلِغُونِ حَاجَةَ مَنْ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِبْلَاغِ حَاجَتِهِ فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ أَبْلَغَ سُلْطَانًا حَاجَةَ مَنْ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِبْلَاغِهَا ثَبَّتَ اللَّهُ قَدَمَيْهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He says, convey the needs of those people who are unable to bring their needs to me. Whoever delivers to me the news and the, the problems of others and conveys their message to me, or any leader of the community for that matter, that person will have steadfast feet. His feet will not have any lapse or luxish on the day of judgment. Just how important it is that someone is unable to bring their request to the leader, you go ahead and take that request if you have access to the leader. And that's how you'll be able to solve the problems of people. Yes, indeed, the Holy Prophet, uh, last days of the Prophet's life, were difficult, you know, 23 years of his life, he goes through many hurdles and difficulties, uh, which leader does not, in the last passing moments of his life, he asks people, you know, that was I kind to you? Was I, a, was I a kind prophet to you? Everyone replies positively. Prophet said, in these years, if I had any haq, any right upon you, ask me right now before I leave so that I can pay off that right which I may have upon you. When Prophet left this world, there was not a debt that people had on him, but the entire humanity was indebted to the Prophet's hard work and what he had left with him. And he left by saying, Inni tarikum fikum that I leave behind you two weighty things. Make sure that you're able to hold on to both of these two, two things until they return to me at the Hawdi Kawthar. One is Quran. And second is my Ahl Bayt. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to ponder over this brief description of the Holy Prophet as the leader of community and be able to apply that to our lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq that we're able to use the uswa hasana of the Holy Prophet and become uswa hasana for our children and our future generations. إن أسر الحديث وأبلغ الموضة كتاب الله عز وجل من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والأسر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر.